Author's Playhouse. Presenting Wilbur Schramm's hilarious story of a mislaid train, Dan Peters and Casey Jones. This story, common knowledge among railroad men, no matter what run they're on, but if you go into a library and start looking for contemporary accounts of the famous lost train by the name of Casey Jones, why, you will have to leaf all through the papers of that year until July the 29th, before you'll even run on to the name of Dan Peters, the engineer who teamed up with Casey Jones. Tonight, Author's Playhouse brings you the whole story, the real facts of what happened, as it presents... Dan Peters and Casey Jones. Well, Casey, old friend, how do you feel this morning, huh? Now, now, Mr. Jones, <laughs> don't let him get you down. We aren't very big, but we're good. <laughs> good old Casey. Yes, sir. When them slick new streamliners is a line along the tracks and a heap of rust and axle grease, we'll still be working the milk run from Prudentia up to Maysville and back again. <laughs> now, isn't that so, huh? That's right! That's right! <laughs> yes, sir, Casey, you tell him. <laughs> Go ahead. Good morning, Bill. Morning, Dan. Got enough steam up? Oh, you got a good head of steam. We're raring to go. Hey, Casey? Let's go! Let's go! All right! Uh, now, why do you suppose that old goat keeps a hollering that every morning? <laughs> he knows we ain't carried a passenger in six months. <laughs> Reckon he wants to be sure all them empty milk cans get aboard. Yeah, rats. Well, Casey, let's go. Bill? Yes? Would you rather own a zebra or a giraffe? I'd rather own a mule and a few acres of ground. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was looking at a map last night, and I found a town named What Cheer Iowa. <laughs> Now, what do you suppose what cheer Iowa is like? I wouldn't rightly know, Dan. Say, Bill, yeah. do you suppose locomotive ever gets jealous of automobiles? Hmm? As far as Casey and me knows, there ain't a hill in the valley with more than one side. Want to bet on it? And no offense to your hometown, but sometimes I get so darn tired of riding into Maysville, Ohio. Maysville, Ohio is one of the most interesting small towns in the United States of America. It has the biggest elm tree in the country. Yeah, that's what I mean. Now, Maysville only had the smallest elm tree once. <laughs> you can't have everything, Dan. Yeah, I know. But every day for 20 years, I've picked up three cans of milk at Ben Apple's farm. Never two or four. For 20 years. How much time we got? Say, wouldn't it be fun to pull a string of sleepers over the painted desert, huh? Or listen to station names like Lackawanna and Hanawanda instead of Maysville, Ohio, some morning. Dan, for a solid man, you've got the unsolidest idea. I don't believe you drive the train off the tracks like an automobile if you could. If you could steer it. Now, wouldn't you? Well, I don't know. Casey and me have a sort of understanding. Hey, Bill. Yeah? Can you keep a secret? What kind of a secret? Come here. You ever notice this here lever before? Why, no, Dan. Never did. Eh, uh, won't see anything like it on any other locomotive in the world. Rigged her up myself in my spare time. With this little lever, me and Casey can go places. He's had a friend. Get Sir E. Bill. And don't you worry about if I could steer it. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Dan, uh, we're coming to the crossing. Ben Apple got his milk out yet? Yeah, he's waiting. How many cans? Three. Ah, there. See what I mean? Milk train coming. Milk train coming. Go 
your move, conductor. Uh-huh. Right into your king roll. Yeah. Then, boy, let's curve a little fast, ain't he? What was that? Oh, I don't know. More than a loose rail, less than a cow. Say, don't them wheels sound funny? They sure do. Hey, wait a minute. Ain't them hills on the wrong side of the train? Hey, Joe, was that an automobile we just went around? It was. I have a sensation we're running on a concrete road. Maybe we're chasing a rabbit. In 25 years on the railroad, I've never seen anything like it. That ain't a dream. Now, listen, Joe. It simply isn't possible for a train to run on a concrete road. You tell that to Sam Peters. We're stubborn. Hello, boys. Hello, Dan. Uh, well, when do we get into Maysville? We don't. Well, where are you headed for, well, Dan? I don't rightly know, except it's nowhere that we've ever been before. We didn't go to run at night because we've always had to run in the daytime. I'm sorry for the inconvenience, but you fellas get off here. What? All set, Bill? Yes, sir, Dan. I'll sober up with the gold. Well, so long, boys. All right, Casey. Let's roll. <laughs> here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So long, so long, so long, so long. <laughs> Pinch me. Pinch me? Gentlemen, I ask you to step in here because a rather odd circumstance has come to my attention of which I thought you would wish to be informed. As traffic manager of the TV and New Railroad, I greatly prefer to settle such small details as may come up from day to day in my own... As president of this line, I greatly dislike to have my time wasted. Now, what is this small detail? Well, Mr. Cornell, gentlemen, it seems that one of our locomotives and its train of cars, consisting of one small coal car and one combination coach and baggage car, has been misplaced. Misplaced? That is to say, lost on its run between Maysville and Prudentia, Ohio. Lost? Yes, sir, such appears to be the case. It went out on its regular run yesterday morning, made one stop to pick up, uh, three cans of milk, and has not been seen since. Well, that's just dandy. (laughs) The train isn't on the tracks or beside the tracks. They rode the whole line. I read a book once about a town that waited all day for a milk train, Then they found that the tracks ended at the edge of town. All other civilization had disappeared. The train never did come in. What happened, Mr. Forbes? The milk spoiled. There was a beautiful red-haired widow in the story. Now, that's a big help. Please, Mr. Forbes, let's get down to cases. My own personal conclusion is that the train must have been filched, or that is to say, stolen by its crew. But who in Toffet? What engineer has managed to do that? Get me a complete report from the personnel department. Uh, pardon me, Mr. Cornell, but I already have a complete report from our file. You let's have it. What are you waiting for? The engineer is one Dan Peters. His record is neat and favorable. He has been engineer on the Boone Valley Spur Line for 20 years. For 20 years, he has had a well-kept timetable. He was believed by the Fennell Department to be meek and gentle, completely dependable, but with no imagination. In short, if you saw a room full of quiet little men, Dan Peters would be the quietest and the littlest. Doesn't seem like the type to run off with a locomotive. I think the train is just plain lost. Mr. Vice President, you can lose a crowbar. You can lose a brakeman. You can even lose an elephant. But you can't lose a train. Hello. Long distance from Ohio. Someone who insists on talking to you, Mr. Cornell. From Ohio? Put him on. Hello. Is this President Cornell? Yes. Uh, I've been trying to get you all day, Mr. Cornell. I'm calling from the jail down here. Now, just a minute. Who in Toffet are you, anyway? I'm Will Hanley, conductor on the Boone Valley Spur Line. Well, where's my train? Uh, that's just what I was going to tell you, Mr. Cornell. 
But Dan Peters put me and the brakeman off about 12 miles out of Maysville on number 20. Highway number 20? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, last I seen of the train, Dan and Black Bill, the fireman, was highballing it down number 20 to the west. Why, did you miss it? Did I? Why, uh, you... uh, Mr. Cornell, sir, uh, what I called about is, when we told the folks in town what happened, the constable run us in for being drunk and disorderly, uh, me and the brakeman. Uh, <clears throat> uh, then they went and fined us a dollar apiece and costs which comes to $39.20, and we only got $3 between us. Uh, so uh, won't you please do something, Mr. Cornell? I'm sorry, my good man, but you'd better sober up before you go calling people long distance. And don't go around talking about this train business either, or people will think you're crazy. Goodbye. Uh, but, Mr. Cornell, what will my wife say? Goodbye. <clears throat> well, gentlemen, it's true. That darn train is loose somewhere roaming the highways. I'd never have believed it possible. I read a book once. You, Mr. Forbes, Mr. Executive Vice President. You seem to have some ideas about this matter. Suppose you go out and find that train. Me? You. After as many years as you've worked with trains that knew where they were going, you ought to find it refreshing to deal with one that doesn't know where it's going. The worst of it is we don't dare go out and get the police and really look for that train... Because if we ever admit we've lost a train, they'll never quit laughing at us. Well, what are you waiting for? Get out of here and find it. Find that train. haired man with red cheeks, doctor. He come to the door and asked if he could park in the barnyard that day since he traveled only at night. I charged him two bits. A minute later, I looked out and this little old train pulled up next to the barn. Uh, two of them men was in overalls, one in a business suit, and they sat there cooking their breakfast on the engine's boiler. I even gave them some cream for their coffee. I tell you, I'm not crazy. When they pulled out, he talked to me. It said, thank you, ma'am, thank you, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> I was taking a little more than my share of the road. These big semi-jobs is hard to handle. Anyways, I hears a whistle, see? And this train comes over the hill. I pulls over to my side quick, but he swipes off my fender and runs me right off the road. I can see the engineer laughing at me as he goes by. I tell you, I was not drunk. <laughs> eyes are smiling, sure the world seems bright and gay, in the... Ah, now look at that. And they can't do that on this highway. One headlight and you'll be my first victim of the night. Glory, Pete is a bright one, too, bright enough to blind the man. And he ought to see me signal well enough. Hey, you, pull over there. What do you think you are? The 20th century king? By the ghost of St. Patrick is a locomotive. Good evening, officer. What's on your mind? The wh Good evening to you, sir. Would that be a locomotive you're driving? It is, sure enough. <laughs> That's what I thought. Now, see here, you watch the meaning of this. Meaning of what, officer? We aren't breaking any laws that I know of. Oh, uh, no. Did you ever hear of the law requiring a motor vehicle to use two headlights? Oh, so that's what's bothering you. Mr. Forbes! Mr. Forbes is the executive vice president of the TVNU. Uh, he knows all about such things. Yes? What is it, Dan? Mr. Forbes, the officer here seems to think that uh, we ought to be carrying two headlights. It's the law covering all motor vehicles. And if you were the devil himself driving a fiery chariot and I caught you in my zone with one headlight, I'd give you a ticket. Now, here. Ah, but my good man, we are not a motor vehicle. As a locomotive, we fit properly under the category of steam engine. There, you see? Yes, sir, I see, although it's very irregular. If you'd care to take the time, I can demonstrate, taking into account the law of optics and several other factors, that we are better lighted than a fleet of 36 and a half automobiles. Is that? And 4,073 and 8 elevenths percent better lighted than your motorcycle. Which is a motor vehicle. Is that the truth? If you'd care to step into the cab for a moment, I'll get a pencil and paper and demonstrate how the... No, 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 never mind, never mind. I'll take your word for it, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, don't mention it, sir. 
By the way, I suppose you've got your driver's license. Oh, yes. Locomotive engineer, licensed to operate under the laws of all states in the USA. See? Yes, sir. Oh, thanks. It's just a formality, you know. Oh, sure. I understand. Well, I guess we'll be rolling. It's been nice seeing you, officer. Oh, and here's that ticket you gave me. <laughs> Don't look like we'll be needing it. <laughs> oh, sure, sure. Well, goodbye. All right. <clears throat> now, Mr. Forbes. Board! How was that, Dan? Well, you're doing fine, Mr. Forbes. Only lean a little more on the oared. Like this. Board! So long, wet foot. So long, wet foot. Wah, 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 wah. Glory be, it was laughing at me. Maybe it's the drag. From now on, I'm a changed man. Mr. Cornell, here's a postcard the girl asked me to give you when you came in. Postcard? Uh, uh, Mammoth Cave, Kentucky. Have found you know what. Dan and I and Bill having fine time. Wish you were here. Sign Forbes. Why that... Where's my hat? Listen, if I'm not back in ten days, send the police after the confounded train. So that's Niagara Falls. Well, I've always had the hankering to see this place. My, but it's a big splash of water. Sure beats anything we got in Ohio. Well, I should think so. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. Where? Over into Canada, of course. In case you can make the grade. I always did want to see a fern country. Feed him some coal, Bill. Sure, Dan. Well, there's a bridge. You think Casey can make it? Ah, uh, we'll make it. Don't you worry. Come on, Casey, old friend. <laughs> We can make it, we can make it, we can make it. Good boy. Hey, look. Red, white, and blue ribbons all over the bridge. Well, glory be. And look at that fellow waving to us. Very likely he wishes to collect the toll. Better hold it up, Dan. Good boy, Casey. Now, uh, now, this is my treat. I, I want to pay the toll. Hey, where do you think you're going with that thing? Well, we just want to cross a bridge like anyone else. My, that's a pretty new bridge, ain't it? Now, let me see now. Well, what does that sign say? 25 cents for a motor vehicle and driver, 5 cents a piece for each additional passenger. That makes a total of 35 cents, right? Here you are, sir, 35 cents even. Say, look here now, that ain't right. And the rules say 25 cents for a motor vehicle. What you've got there looks more like a train. Did you say looks like a train? Never mind, Casey. Don't let them hurt your feelings. We aren't very big, but we're good, aren't we, Casey? Say, you must be Dan Peters himself. And this is Casey. <laughs> Jumping G. Hossifat. Why, you're famous all over the United States, Mr. Peters. Huh? Say, people have been looking for you all over the country ever since the story came out in the papers. And Casey. Gosh, but I expected something bigger. Me and Casey in the papers? People have been saying you were seen last night down in Alabama. Hey, look here, let's settle this little... Uh... Financial transactions. Thirty-five cents, all right? Gosh, I'd sure like to let Casey through, but until this bridge is dedicated, he can't cross or nobody else. This here is the brand new international bridge, and it ain't going to be dedicated till this afternoon. What kind of a bridge you say this was? It's called the International Bridge. It's a sort of memorial to international peace and friendship. So it's going to be dedicated this afternoon by a lot of big shots. Oh, so that's why they got all them red, white, and blue ribbons, eh? Well, Forbes, looks like we got here just in the nick of time. Yeah, this here is a big thing. A memorial to international peace and friendship. Hey, what do you say if we just pull up by these here ribbons and wait to see this here dedication? Right, huh? old Dan. Well, Casey would like to be in on a big affair like this. Dan, I don't know much about dedications, but it sure is time for breakfast. Well, coffee's already perking in the boiler. Uh, Mr. Guard, uh, would you care to join us? I'd sure be honored, Mr. Peter. Mr. Forbes, will you pour? 
We'll drink a toast to this here pretty new bridge and to international peace. Right, Casey, old boy? That's right, Dan! And so, in the absence of the Secretary of War... I am happy to have the privilege of coming here today to participate in this momentous occasion, the dedication of the International Bridge. A momentous occasion, I say, for this is more than the dedication of a great bridge. It is a symbol, a memorial to international peace and friendship between the people of two we great... Peter! Peters. Come up here quickly. Uh, I'm right here, Governor. Well, Mr. Peters, you've got to speak to these people. Me? Oh, I can't make a speech, Mr. Governor. Oh, listen to that crowd. Oh, Mr. Peters, this way. Well, we are fortunate in having with us today Mr. Dan Peters of the TV and New Railroad and uh, uh, other points who will now speak to you. Mr. Peters. Well, 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 folks. Uh, I ain't any good at speeches. Only thing I can say is, Casey and me have seen a lot of beautiful things since we've been on our own, but nothing that can hold a candle to this here wonderful new bridge. Uh, that's all, and, and I thank you. <laughs> I guess you and Casey have seen and done about everything now, haven't we? Well, we've been around. Just two things more we'd like to see. A zebra and President Frank Cornell of the team he and you. <laughs> Here I am, Dan Peters. Uh, move aside, Dan. Move aside. Uh, let him go. I'm Frank Cornell. It is. It is Frank Cornell. Uh, Mr. Peters, I wanted to meet you. Bad. President Frank Cornell. Well, I'm sure pleased to make your acquaintance. My, but I thought you would be bigger. I thought you'd be bigger, too. I thought you'd be 20 feet tall. Mr. President, I want to tell you that I'm sorry I didn't keep the schedule. Dan, I can't forgive you for not keeping the schedule. But what I can't forgive, I can sometimes forget. I'm going to forget what you didn't do and remember what you did do. Uh, Mr. Peters, if you can move your train enough so we can get the official automobile past it, we want you to cut the ribbon and ride over the bridge with us in the first car. Did you say automobile? We'll ride over in Casey. Plenty of room in the coach and baggage car for all of you. Why, that sounds just fine, but uh, uh, there's one favor I'd like to ask. Uh, what's that? Could I ride up in the cab? I've always wanted to do that ever since I was a boy. Well... <laughs> Casey would feel right proud to have a real governor right up there in the cab with him. And you too, President Cornell, if you'll do us honor. Why, Dan, the honor's all mine, and I really mean that. Well, fine. What are we waiting for? Come on. Governor, you go around up the rest of the officials, herd them into the baggage car, and let's get a roll. Right, Mr. Peters. I'll hurry. <laughs> Mr. Cornell, this is Casey. Casey, I want you to meet our president, Frank Cornell. Thank you. Step right up, Cornell. Oh, oh, oh look out. You don't all over grease oh, there. Oh, thanks, Dan. And the blazes with the grease. President Cornell, I reckon you know Mr. Forbes. Yes. Well, Forbes, I see you found the train. Uh, yes, I did, sir, but it seems as if Casey wasn't quite ready to go home. Well, they're all in, Mr. Peters. Ready to go now. All right, all set, Governor. Uh, but wait a minute. That was a mighty poor kind of a speech I made, uh, uh, could you reach out there and get that microphone over to me from the platform? i got something else I want to say. This here's more than just a bridge. It's a kind of stand for something. It seems like somebody ought at least to mention it. Yes, now here you are, Mr. Peters. Oh, thank you kindly, sir. Folks! <laughs> Folks! They tell me that this is a peace bridge. Peace is when you don't have to be afraid. When all the tough guys keep on their side of the road. That's what we call law and order, I reckon. 
And when you've got that, you've got freedom for the little guys who aren't going to hurt nobody. Freedom to look at Niagara Falls and get to know somebody in what highway. And when you get to know somebody, pretty soon you find somebody you can trust, like the U.S. and Canada. And because the U.S. trusts Canada, we got this here bridge. And a mighty pretty one it is. And I thank you. All right, Mr. Governor, we're both. May I say all aboard? Why, yeah, go ahead. Now, all aboard! done a great thing for the railroads. You've been worth thousands of dollars in advertising. The question is, what do you want to do now? Would you like to be a vice president? Oh, oh, shucks, Mr. Cornell. I, I'm just an engineer. <laughs> we'll give you a new 16-coach diesel streamliner. You can get 20,000 applications for your first trip. We'll pass an act of Congress. You can go where you want to. Well, no, Mr. President, no. You see, Casey has a soul. You can talk to him. You can't talk to these shiny new engines. All you can do is feed them oil and grease. I don't know whether souls grow or you build them in. Well, I suspect they grow. But you can't drive Casey anymore. His boiler sags like an old horse's back, and every wheel is worn down below the flanges. He's just plain worn out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Casey's old and tired. So am I. Yep, I'm at pension age, and I expect we ought to retire. You know, it's a funny thing. As long as Casey and me was tied to the milk run, we always had a hankering to see the rest of the world. But now that we've seen it, I kind of feel there ain't no nicer place to be anywhere than in the shade of that big old elm that stands in the square at Maysville. What do you think, Casey? Uh, let's go home. Let's go home. have just heard Wilbur Schramm's story, Dan Peters and Casey Jones, adapted for Author's Playhouse by Carl and Marjorie Weber and directed by Frank Papp. Cliff Subir was heard as Dan Peters. The musical score was composed and conducted by Dr. Roy Shield. The special sound effects on this program were heard through the cooperation of Wright Sonovox Incorporated. Next week, same time, same station, Author's Playhouse will be Lewis Bromfield's story of Paris under the Nazi terror until the daybreak. Author's Playhouse came to you from Chicago. This is the National Broadcasting Company.